from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you asked my partner, Bill, who is of half Italian ancestry, he would tell you that he truly could live on bread and pasta alone. I cannot, and I imagine that's true for many people. If not by bread alone, then by what are we nourished? And which do you feed first, your body or your soul? Those who are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs would say, body first. As a dietitian of 36 years and a lifelong foodie, I can teach and coach you about optimal nutrition for your body, the need for variety and balance, the importance of vitamins, minerals, color, texture, flavor, and aroma to feed both our bodies and our senses. We need more than bread to feed the essence of self, that part of us one might call soul or spirit. In this extended pandemic with social isolation, physical distancing, fear, and uncertainty, how can we nourish our spirits? What comes to my mind includes things such as meditation or prayer, hiking in the woods, yoga, paddling a kayak, composing music, or journaling. For others, it's registering citizens to vote, marching in protest, organizing and leading action to help create a more peaceful and equitable world. For me, there are several ways I renew and nourish my spirit. Spending holy time on the sacred ground of beach, collecting donations for the food pantry and homeless shelter, knitting for the comfort of those who are cold, and deep reading in the sacred silence of my home late at night. May you find comfort and joy in what feeds your soul. Come, let us worship together. And we join Unitarian Universalists across the country in lighting a chalice, a sign of life's beauty and wonder a symbol of peace and hope, an invitation to continue our ongoing search for the light of truth within us and among us, and a reminder that we are all interconnected in the great web of existence of which we are each a beloved part. As I light our shared chalice, I invite you to light your home chalice. invite you now to join in the words for the chalice lighting, our words of covenant by James the Thiel of Lay. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. In the spirit of giving thanks and in the spirit of deepening our connections, creating a sense of belonging, and offering each other support and compassion as our life journeys as individuals and a community continue. We take time now to share our joys and concerns, our struggles and achievements, our hopes and dreams with one another. Our candle of memory is for Harry Noden, who died peacefully last Sunday, 
July 26th. Harry's memorial service will be virtual and will be on Sunday, August 16th at 3 p.m. Elaine shares the joy of for her niece Megan and her husband Paul, who welcomed their first child, Maisie Giovanni, on July 31st. Yay. Becky uh, asks us to hold her brother in North Carolina as he faces more chemo. We keep him in our heart and our thoughts. And we send happy birthday wishes to Lois Weir. Happy day, Lois. Al sends blessings to his daughter Hallie, who moved to Atlanta yesterday. Diane shares her. Gratitude that her mother is home from the hospital and healing. Heidi shares a sad day yesterday as she removed her husband's clothes in the closet. Deborah Lynn is grateful for AmeriCorps in Colorado, giving her son a job during these times. Good luck, Benji. Jen May sends thanks that for those who came to celebrate with Megan and her friend Ryan in a drive-by celebration. Uh, some great cupcakes, by the way. Thank you. We send our thoughts, prayers, and wishes for healing and peace to Jan Noden. The Rome family shared they went camping for three days and went swimming. That's Ray Lynn telling us. Thank you. Carol's asking prayers for her son-in-law's father, Tony, who's on a ventilator from COVID. Kevin shares the joy after a week of working at virtual summer camp with Camp Lilac, which is a camp for transgender youth. Thank you for doing that, Kevin. We send our sympathy and care to Renee's colleague, Jessica, who lost her husband on Monday. I share my gratitude to each of you as we begin year three together. Now invite us into a few moments of silence to hold those we've named in our hearts and our minds, to honor connections with one another and with the spirit of life itself, and to offer gratitude for this beautiful world in which we live and thrive. Center some silence. Mary Oliver's poem. Every summer, I listen and look under the sun's brass and even into the moonlight, but I can't hear anything. I can't see anything. Not the pale roots digging down, nor the green stalks muscling up, nor the leaves deepening their damp pleats nor the tassels making, nor the shucks, nor the cobs. And still, every day, the leafy fields grow taller and thicker. Green gowns lofting up in the night, showered with silk. And so, every summer, I fail as a witness, seeing nothing. I am deaf, too, 
to the tick of the leaves, the tapping of downwardness from the banyan feet, all of it happening beyond any seeable proof or hearable hum. And therefore, let the immeasurable come. Let the unknowable touch the buckle of my spine. Let the wind turn in the trees and the mystery hidden in the dirt swing through the air. How could I look at anything in this world and tremble and grip my hands over my heart? What should I fear? One morning in the leafy green ocean, the honeycomb of the corn's beautiful body is sure to be there. Thank you, Elaine. In the spring, I put eight tomato plants in my garden along with herbs and cucumbers. I've watered and weeded and watched the plants grow. Now I'm enjoying the fresh produce from my garden, including Roma, and cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, fresh herbs. Do you have any favorite foods this time of year? You're welcome to share them in the chat box. Peaches, yes, tomatoes, yes. Blueberries, yummy. Corn, corn, sweet corn, blueberries, summer squash, all sorts of peppers, Red Haven peaches, sweet corn, watermelon, nectarines, plums, fresh beets, blueberries, and zucchini, sweet corn, yay, winter squash, blueberries, real tomatoes. Yeah, two things that money can't buy. Love and homegrown tomatoes, so true. Chard, patty pan squash, Ohio corn, fresh lettuce, sweet corn, zucchini, tomatoes. So much abundance. Summer is at its peak. The pagan festival of Lamas is a time of celebration as the harvest starts and we enjoy nature's bounty. We are reminded once again how we depend on the earth for all our needs and that we are not apart from the earth. We belong to the great interconnected web of all existence, which is our Unitarian Universalist seventh principle. Today, the earth invites us to flow in body and spirit with the turning of the season and feel gratitude and joy, the blessing of being alive as we watch life unfold around us. In the second reading, Mary Oliver invited us to participate in this great mystery and to trust the cycles of life. And therefore, she says, let the immeasurable come. Let the unknowable touch the buckle of my spine. Let the wind turn in the trees and the mystery hidden in the dirt swing through the air. How could I look at anything in this world and tremble and grip my hands over my heart? What should I fear? Lamas is about abundance and the promise of completion of what we began in the spring. It's also about change. One writer says, after the high stability of summer solstice, Lamas offers a cascade of impending difference. The ebbing of light at the shores of the day, the early morning fall smell in the air, the sense of every precious summer day sliding faster and faster out from under us. After the peak at the top of the roller coaster hill that measures from the solstice till the 4th of July, it seems time tilts downwards in a rapid descent, an ever-increasing momentum, breathless in movement toward the harvest, toward school, toward the folds of time, towards winter. We come to this point again and again. August 1st, August 2nd, another summer coming to a close, one of so many and another autumn on its way. An end to make way for something new to begin again and again and again. Starhawk, who is a writer and leader in modern earth-based spirituality, justice, and activism, says that Lamas is a time when the grain stands golden in the fields, but has not yet been gathered in. We stand poised between hope and fear. This particular harvest feels very powerful to me, both in its hope and its fear. There is so much uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen as the pandemic continues to wreak havoc and death. As I think about the upcoming election, 
We are in a time of great social, political, and cultural turmoil. Will we choose the leaders we need to guide us through this time and to help us overcome all the things that divide us as a people? As a congregation, in the middle of these unpredictable times, we stand poised between hope and fear. We continue to change, which is always unsettling, but what will that change bring? Will we grow to be the presence in the greater Kent area we aspire to be? Will we invite others to join in our work of transforming the world? As individuals, we each stand on the horizon, growing, maturing, changing, aging, learning, laughing, loving, wondering, asking our questions, experiencing life's joys and sorrows. What will the days ahead bring each of us? We don't know, but we can reflect on what we've learned and how that learning will help us in the future. Today is an opportunity to do a spiritual harvest that begins with remembering that we are more than a consumption unit in the economy or a unit of production in the corporate world. We are not the work we do or the money we make. We are first and foremost spiritual beings, intimate participants in the eternal cycle of birth, living and death. We do not live for bread alone. We need beauty and wonder, feeling awe at the infinite, beautiful design of the world, the greatest creation of art we can know. We are reminded that the greatest work we have to do is to love deeply from within, to continue to become who we are meant to be. Lamas is an invitation to take stock, which pertains not only to the harvests as they begin, but also to take stock of ourselves, reevaluating our goals, our lives, our paths, our relationships, our strengths, and our weaknesses. Percival Chubb wrote, from the harvest of the soil, we are given occasion to garner a harvest of the heart and mind, a harvest of resolve to be careful stewards of all of life's gifts and opportunities. The harvest is a time of preparation for the future amidst great abundance. Food that was grown during these warm months must be stored properly to provide nourishment for the entire year. So we also reflect on those things we have harvested in the past year the things that are new and good and abundant in our lives. We think about how to preserve those things as we move forward into the future. As we celebrate Lamas, the first harvest, and we enjoy the abundance of the earth with a spirit of gratitude, may the blessings and gifts of this season renew and sustain us in the days to come. I invite us now to sit together in silence for a few moments to reflect and to do our own spiritual harvest. So today I'm going to tell you a story about a little purple hen, which is actually a combination of a story, the little purple hen and the little red UU hen. I've kind of mashed them all together. Uh, this is in honor of celebrating Lamas which is our sixth source of spiritual wisdom, earth-centered traditions. So, the characters in our story include the little purple hen, the lion, the elephant, the horse, and the panda bear, and I added a dinosaur. There was a spring day when the little purple hen found a bag of weed seeds, grain she didn't know she had. She called her animal friends together and asked, who will help me plant this wheat? Not I, said the lion. I'm too busy on a petition to stop big game hunting. Not I, said the elephant. I'm going fishing. Not I, said the panda. We need to practice physical distancing. Not I, said the horse. I'm in the middle of reading a great book about church mission. The horse doesn't choose from the bestseller list. So what did the dinosaur say? Rah, right? So the little purple hen said, okay, fine. I'll just do it myself, and she did. And of course, wheat needs to be watered and weeded, and the little purple hen said to her animal friends, who will help me water and weed the wheat? The lion said, not I, I'm going to teach religious education. Not I, said the elephant, I have to go to a rally for undocumented immigrants. Not I, said the panda, 
we need to practice physical distancing and my mask needs washing. Not I, said the horse. I'll be reading the latest issue of the UU world. And what did the dinosaur say? Arr. So the little purple hen sighed and said, fine, I'll do it myself. And she did. The little purple hen watered and waited as the wheat grew. August came and the wheat was tall and golden and it was ready to be cut. The little purple hen said to her animal friends, who will help me harvest? Do you suppose the lion, the elephant, the panda, the horse and the dinosaur will help her? No, nope. not I, said the lion. I'm gonna make phone calls for the Animal Freedom Political Party. Not I, said the elephant. I'll be volunteering at Kent Social Services. Not I, said the panda. Well, maybe, but only if we can do it and stay six feet apart. Not I, said the horse. I'm gonna argue about the existence of God with my minister. And what did the dinosaur say? Rawr. The little purple hen sighed again and said, fine, I'll just do it myself. And she did. Now it was time for the wheat to be threshed. That's where you separate the grain you can eat from the plant around it. Then the grain needed to be taken to the mill to be ground into flour, and then the flour to the little purple hen's house. Making bread is a lot of work. The little purple hen got mad and thought, wait a minute, I can't do all this by myself. I need help. Why aren't my friends helping me? And she felt herself getting angry and frustrated and was just about to start yelling at her friends. Something came over her. What is this? The little purple hen asked. It's the UU spirit, said a voice. It's the spirit reminding you that we're here to support each other with love, respect, and compassion. We're all on this journey together and we each have important work to do to make the world a better place. Your friends will help if you ask again. So the little purple hen went to her quiet place. She did some yoga and some meditation and she got calm. Then she said to her friends, I'd like to spend some time together with you and hear about what you've been doing. Will you help me get this wheat ready so we can all talk and eat fresh baked bread together? So what do you suppose the lion said? You betcha. And the elephant and the panda and the horse and the dinosaur? Well, the dinosaur said, rawr, but everyone else said, I will. And they did. The panda even brought masks for everyone. The horse brought a gluten-free loaf of bread ready to pop in the oven too. So everyone mixed the dough and let it rise and baked it in giant ovens. They kept doing this over and over. And at the end of the day, they put the last loaves in the oven and counted all the loaves that were cooling on the counters. A lion said, and with those in the oven, we have 267 loaves of bread. They looked at each other in amazement. Well, of course, we'll each take some, said the little purple hen, but there's so much. What will we do with it all? The horse said, I know of a homeless shelter that would love fresh bread. And Panda said, I know a daycare program with kids that would love fresh bread. The elephant says, Kent Social Services has giant freezers so they can freeze a lot of bread to eat later. And the dinosaur said, of course, rawr. And then they all sat together and ate warm bread and drank cider. Each animal took several loaves home and they delivered bread to the homeless shelter and the daycare and Kent Social Services. And the little purple hen said, thank you. So we are like the animals in this story. We each have our own special things to do, those things we care about. But we're also here in this community because there are things we can't do by ourselves. When we help each other, there are some amazing things we can do together. As a community, we are strong together and able to do so many amazing things because each of you pitches in and shares the gifts of your time, your talents, and your financial resources. Thank you. Now in the spirit of gratitude for the gifts of the earth and the first harvest we celebrate this morning, we give and receive the offering as a sign of our shared commitment to the life and work of this community.
The silver rain, the shining sun, and fields where scarlet poppies run, and all the ripples of the wheat are in the bread that I do eat. For as I sit at every meal, and sing a grace I always feel that I am eating rain and sun and fields where scarlet poppies run the fields below the sky above enfold us in God's arms of love the clouds of mist, the endless sea, become a part of you and me. The precious atmosphere that girths, the narrow vault twixt heaven and earth. For this we offer prayers and laud the life sustaining breath. Now, would you join in the responsive reading, A Harvest of Gratitude by Percival Chubb. I will lead with the plain words, and I invite you to respond with the words in italics, and Elaine will lead you. Once more, the fields have ripened to harvest, and the fruitful earth has fulfilled the promise of spring. The work of those who labor has been rewarded. They have sown and reaped, planted and gathered. How rich and beautiful is the bounty gathered, the golden grain and clustered corn, the grapes of purple and green. The crimson apples and yellow pears, and all the colors of orchard and garden, vineyard and field. Season follows after season, after winter the spring, after summer the harvest laden autumn. From bud to blossom, from flower to fruit, from seed to bud again, the beauty of earth unfolds. From the harvest of the soil, we are given occasion to garner a harvest of the heart and mind. A harvest of resolve to be careful stewards of all life's gifts and opportunities. A harvest of reverence for the wondrous power and life at work in things that grow and in the soil. In the soul. A harvest of gratitude for every good which we enjoy, and of fellowship for all who are sustained by earth's beauty. Now to bring our time of harvest celebration to its close, would you join me in extinguishing the chalice? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. May we carry these in our hearts and minds until we are together again. These are the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, not some more convenient season. It is today that our best work can be done and not some future day or future year. It is today that we fit ourselves for the greater usefulness of tomorrow. We have known the seed time, the hours of work, and now comes the harvest and the play time. So now grateful for the gifts of the earth that sustain our bodies and our spirits and renewed in our commitment to life to fit ourselves for the needs and work of tomorrow. Let us go forth in joy and in hope, continue inspiring love, seeking justice and growing in community. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen.